Hey everybody, it's FLF back for another Light of Babylon. Before we dive into the episode, please be sure to hit the like button and the subscribe button. Hitting the like button helps boost this video for the YouTube algorithm and subscribing obviously will let you know when new videos are uploaded. Also be sure to tap that bell so you can get personalized notifications. So without further ado, let's dive into today's video topic. One of the reasons I call this Light of Babylon is because we want to use the light of Christ to expose darkness. And I think in culture, specifically American culture, what I'm most familiar with, we see a lot of of light that is imitating to be light, but is not actually the light of Christ. That's why it's more important than ever to shine the light of Christ into Babylon so that it could be a sword and a cutting dividing knife to separate truth from lies. One thing I am maybe a little guilty of on this channel is I like, always will go after uh, for the most part, the secular world that's happening, whether it's music, media, content, or perspectives, I'm usually approaching the secular. But in this case, I really want to take a hone in and a focus on this particular video uh, posted by Emmanuel Ocho, or H-O, I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, but really, I want to focus in on this video where it is a Christian influencer, a man who, who professes to be a Christian, who puts you know Christ at the very center of a lot of his teachings and what he talks about. But... On this particular topic, when it comes to Roe v. Wade, pro-choice versus pro-life, gets it way, way wrong. I think it's important to shine a light on this because the fact is Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. God has not changed. His commandments have not changed. His perspective on things has not changed. And it's all documented very clearly in a great book called the Bible. The reason I think this is so important to, to tackle and dive into is because we have so many people that look up to these influencers, that look up to these celebrities, these, um, these you know, really successful and accomplished people, and they take their opinion as fact, when in fact it is not, but merely just that, it is an opinion. And I wanna be mindful of how we approach this because obviously anything to do with abortion or pro-choice or pro-life is a very sensitive topic. And I wanna be sure to, to clarify from the jump that we're not taking any at these women, we're not taking aim at Emmanuel, we're taking aim at their ideas and their philosophies, which are opposite to what scripture says. To be frank, if this was a secular video creating this topic and discussing why, pro, uh, why abortion or pro-choice is the best option, I probably wouldn't even cover it because you know the, the standpoint of where they're coming from makes sense from a humanistic worldview. But from the Bible, from, from Christianity, from what Christ teaches and what the, the Bible has shown over and over again, it is not aligned with scripture and we're seeing a very poisonous um, heresy fall into the church through conversations like these. So what I'm gonna do is be watching this and give it a blow by blow and we'll just, uh, yeah, kind of go from there. I'm Sonia Richards Ross, four time Olympic gold medalist. And in 2008, I had an abortion because I wasn't ready to be a mom. I was still passionately chasing my childhood dreams. I think it's interesting, the first kind of point that's made here, and again, not to take aim at her or, you know, the decision that she's necessarily made, even though I think she made the wrong decision and ended an innocent life. In this case, we have someone who ended a pregnancy, had an abortion because they were chasing a dream. Okay, not because their life was threatened, not because it was going to be something that uh, would damage their body, leave them paralyzed, um, injure them severely for the rest of their lives. Nothing like that. There's no, um, dare I say, noble cause in this case for having an abortion. One other thing to point out about this video is that every single person on the panel that's discussing it is a pro-choice position. So the idea of this, the video is titled Pro-Life versus Pro-Choice. It's not really pro-life versus pro-choice. It's pro-choice and they're giving their opinions as to why that's the case. Childhood dreams. My name is Dr. Yanni Abraham, and I'm a doctor of pelvic physical therapy. In 2021, I had to have an abortion to save my life. I'm Andrea. This is another interesting thing, too. We've been seeing this pop up more and more and more, this idea that you have to have an abortion to save your life. I'm going to probably cover this a little bit later in the video, but usually an abortion to save your life really means a procedure to save your life, which ends in the fetus not being able to live. That's much different than ending an innocent life or taking an innocent life or ending an abortion for something like a career, um, a dream that you're chasing, um, or you know, not being in a financial position to afford a baby. These are all totally different things. I'm MJ Acosta Ruiz, I'm a journalist, and in 2004 I had an abortion because I did not have the financial means to support a child. You know, kind of tying to that point right there, didn't have the financial means. I get it, people struggle financially. The idea that you have to have an abortion to um, to, to because of finances, I think is a very skewed uh, mindset, especially in the United States, which is so rich and abundant in resources. And especially when 
if you are a Christian, which I believe all of these women are saying that they are Christian, you have a church to tap into. You have family to tap into. There's a lot of options to tap into from that standpoint. Or, by the way, you can just give the, the baby up for adoption. That is a totally viable option. Whether or not you believe they're going to have the best life by doing so, it's a totally nuanced discussion that could be had. But that can, I'm sure someone would rather be in the foster care system, get adopted by a family, than have no opportunity at any life whatsoever. Yeah, women. And abortion is either their best kept or, depending on how you look at it, their worst kept secret. Why is now the time for you to share your story? The moment I saw the news pop up on my phone, I... Well, I think it's kind of funny how he frames it as it could either be your best kept or worst kept. Why would it be a worst kept secret? Why are we even framing it as something that is a bad thing if it is not what it is, right? And, and what I mean by this is there was a comedian, um, I forget exactly who said it, I think it might've been Bill Burr, who said something to the extent of, you know, Christians are, are protesting these Planned Parenthood facilities because they actually believe that children, babies are being killed there. In the same light, when someone says an abortion should be safe and infrequent or something to the effect of safe and rare, right? Why should it be rare? If it's not ending a human life, why not have them all the time whenever you want? And that is the position of some abortionists, but why not have them all the time whenever you want, if they're not taking a human life, if they're not a bad thing? But if they are, then we have to acknowledge the value of human life and the actual process of abortion that's taking place. I thought of my past self, of that moment. And for the first hour, I felt sorrow for the women who who are now in a situation where they feel helpless. You know, there's a, a human side or a, a side that a Christian can kind of take where empathy can be felt when, when you see a situation where, you know, people are gonna be in a hard position. You never want people to be in a hard position or a tough position or feel like they're poor, they can't make it, fall into a depression. You never want people to feel this way, right? Like that is a, a terrible mindset to be in and we don't advocate that people feel this way. At the same time, the resolution to experiencing an incredible hardship during an incredibly trying time is not to kill a child or to kill an innocent child and have an abortion. The act does not reflect a positive result. If you were feeling depressed and you started working out and you noticed that going to the gym was making you feel better, that's a positive result from a positive action. Having an abortion does not remove the trauma, it does not remove um, the pain, does not remove the situation you're in, it only exacerbates it and creates more trauma that you're gonna have to deal with down the line. So uh, again, this idea that you know these women are gonna feel helpless, I understand a feeling of desperation, not knowing where to turn, not knowing what to do, but in the same time, why is the only option in abortion? And who don't know where to turn and who think that there is no option for them. And there are plenty of options for these women and for these children. Let's just reiterate that, especially if you are a Christian and you're tapped into a local church, there is a community there for you. I am 99% sure of it. And for the 1% that I might not have, uh, believe me, there's a church out there looking for women to take care of. And it shatters the deepest part of my soul for them. So this is the time, if not now, when. Take me back to the moment in which you had to make that very difficult decision yeah. of having an abortion. And how are you feeling now in light of the Supreme Court's decision. Yeah, I was about barely 20 years old. I think I had just turned 20 years old and I had just dropped out of college. So very much a point in my life where I was lost. My parents are immigrants. They immigrated to this country well into their 30s, leaving behind very good careers in their homeland. You know, it's no, uh, something else that I notice a lot is when these women start telling their story about abortion or the reasons that they had it or what they had to go through in the process of getting it, they always cue this music and cue a very beautiful story that's being told. Again, being 20, you just dropped out of college and you find out you're pregnant, <clears throat> that's challenging, that's tough. If you are a Christian, we have to claim the promises that God has given us. If he'll clothe the, the lilies of the field, surely we shouldn't have anything to worry about. Why do we fret for tomorrow's anxiety? Tomorrow will deal with itself. We have so many scriptures that reminds us of the comfort, the sustenance that God has provided. We see it in the, in the Old Testament as well, when the nation of he, uh, Israel was leaving Egypt, what God did for them in the desert. He made manna come from heaven. He sent pigeons down when they asked for meat. He struck water, or excuse me, Moses struck a stone and water came out. Every single time and every single step along the way, God did something. He provided for his people first, 
and then came and made an agreement with them. God always delivers before he enters into a covenant. And I think that's something important to kind of keep in mind too, that in these trying situations, these are opportunities where we can either have a story where we stick to what God has written in his word, and we have a powerful testimony that we could share with the world, or we stray from it. And every single person will make decisions that's not in line with what the Bible says and what God's will is for their life. But does that mean that they should be cast aside and advocate for those decisions once they've been made? Absolutely not. Poor decisions can be made, but the consequences of those decisions will always exist. So with that being said, let's make better decisions and not advocate for the poor decision making of our past selves. There was so much going on at that point in time where I felt like I was already letting them down in so many different ways. Um, and then I found out that I was pregnant. And I just remember thinking, my parents did not do all of this to bring me here for me to now bring a child and for them to be in poverty, for them to suffer. and for Well, you know, when you kind of give that perspective, I don't know that she grew up in what her situation was growing up, but I imagine that if her parents came over in their 30s to offer her a better life, there was a period of uh, there was a period of her life that was probably in poverty. I imagine being an immigrant, coming in, not knowing anything. I imagine there was a period where you came in and you were in poverty. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know how to, how to move. Um, you know, you might have been on food stamps. You might have uh, been on welfare, whatever the case might be. But there might have been a point in time where you were in poverty. Does that mean your life is any less valuable because you're in a situation where you're in poverty? And, you know, something that I've come to know, being a father myself and having two children, children pretty much never know that they're in a bad situation when they're in it. A kid is incredibly resilient and what we might look at as a painful memory or as a sad time when we didn't get them the best Christmas uh, gifts, we didn't have the biggest party for them, they're just gonna remember that time with you, your family, your grandparents, those loved ones around you, and the money doesn't matter at all. So just something to think about there as well. To suffer and for me to suffer along with them. I think that next line is a little bit telling, you know, for, for me to bring in this child to suffer and then for me to suffer along with them. Could it be that we make these decisions around abortions for selfish reasons? I think it's very possible. And I've said this in a past video, but we often will make sacrifices um, for these idols in our life. We'll make sacrifices for our career. We'll make sacrifices, um, you know, for our loved ones, for our relationships. We'll make sacrifices for material things, right? Is it possible that we are sacrificing our children as well for these things like career, material wealth, and pride, rather than just submitting to God's plan and knowing and trusting that he has a purpose for this life that's inside of you and for this life that's to come? And so I very quickly decided that abortion was the way for me to go. How difficult was that decision? There was a little back and forth because I remember when I... It's interesting here too because she's saying that I made the decision almost immediately that I was going to get an abortion and then Emmanuel kind of responds and says, okay, well, how hard of a decision was that for you? Re really, it wasn't a hard decision. She kind of shared that, right? It wasn't a difficult decision. It was a decision she already had already made. Now, one of the things I, I want to do, this could be a long video. I don't want to watch every single one of these stories. Um, so I'm just going to skip ahead to the next one. But each one of these stories does have a common theme that we're going to end up eventually seeing. You were headed to Beijing where the Olympics were to take place and you had to make one of the toughest decisions of your life. Can you take me to that moment? Some young girls might think of like their wedding day and you know, have all these different kinds of dreams. But from the age of nine, the one sole dream that always felt very real to me was becoming an Olympic champion. For me, in that moment. So right here, Sonia is saying, the dream that I had was to become an Olympic champion, right? And we're seeing kind of a pattern. The first one was, why did you have the abortion? Because you weren't financially ready. You were 20, you were out of college, you weren't financially ready. The, the second reason here has nothing to do with finances. Um, I think she goes on to reveal that she was engaged um, at the time or was about to get married to a, a, a man who was an NFL athlete. So money was not a problem. This was purely about her dreams. She didn't want to compromise her ability to become a gold medalist for this life. So again, I, I go back to that point. We make sacrifices all the time. We sacrifice for our career, our livelihood, material possessions, pride. What are we sacrificing in this case for our dreams? We're sacrificing the child for a gold medal, for, for something that will ultimately burn in the scape of eternity from a Christian standpoint. 
that gold medal that you're going to receive or that that life or that career that you're going to have in the, the landscape of eternity as a Christian will mean nothing. But the life that you bring in and nurture and lead to the kingdom of heaven will mean everything. Moment when I found out I was pregnant right before I left for Beijing, I felt like I was in an impossible situation because I knew I was with my forever. I was with my soon to be husband. I knew I wanted to have a family with him. Um, but I also wanted to be an Olympic champion more than anything. The day before I left for Beijing, um, I had an abortion. We all make mistakes and we make decisions. If she was coming forth and talking about this in a repentant manner to say, you know what, I regret making this decision, I wish I never made this decision, and I would advise anyone else considering not to make this, it would be a totally different perspective than to say, you know, I wanted this dream, I knew this was gonna interfere with it, and I removed this obstacle to get to the goal that I had that I had in mind. And as a woman who also identifies as a Christian woman, uh, who tries to be Christ-like, I never ever thought that I would be in that situation. It was, it, it, it's still. It you know, this is something um, also kind of worth noting is that God kind of outlines the really important values of what a marriage should look like. And one of the things about a marriage is that you should always wait until you are married to have children. And, you know, um, or ha to, to have sex even, not even to have children, to have sex. Um, and again, not to shade her, but if she had waited until she was married and had set her affairs in order, her dream, God would have given that to her. Her success, if she attributed to God, I have no doubt God would give that to her via hard work, via the commitment and the faith that she would have had. There is no reason that a child or you know being pregnant at the time would have come into play had she had honored that first commitment to God. And again, not, not speaking as someone here who has never made a mistake in their entire life because I've made plenty, but that idea there I think should be kind of presented as an option as well to say, if this was as serious to you as your relationship with God, why are these decisions being made over and over. And maybe it was a mistake, maybe it was an accident, but once we make a mistake, we have to face the consequences associated with that mistake. It, it still is really hard for me to talk about it, but um, I am grateful, however, that I had the choice. I am. Had the choice to do what? We always talk about having the choice. Having the choice to do what? To end a life in pursuit of self. That's what that choice is. That's all the choice. That's, that's the extent of the choice making right here. That is what is being said. And why do we keep championing this idea? I don't understand that whatsoever. I am grateful that I had the choice because um, although it was very, very hard for me and I think it was a big part of why I didn't win gold because I didn't think I deserved it. Wow. So the one race I lost, the Olympic. Interesting, she made the sacrifice and God removed it. I wonder if she had kept the child and went and competed in spite of being pregnant if she would have come out and been successful and taken home that gold medal. I wonder, right? You can only imagine, but the faith that God has, or excuse me, the faith that we have in God is usually reciprocated in our life. When we demonstrate faithfulness to God, there's nothing he can do but bless us because that's what he wants to do. When he looks at us, he sees Christ, he sees that faithfulness, and when we're moving hand and foot in step with the Holy Spirit, God blesses us so abundantly, even, even if it's just being in his presence. So this idea that she made that sacrifice and then didn't get the gold medal that she was planning to, I think is a really telling sign of this spiritual kind of journey. The Olympic final was the race I wanted the most when I lined up. I didn't feel deserving of Why being not? Olympic. Why didn't you feel like you deserved it? Because I had just done the one thing I thought I'd never do and I feel like good things come from God and I didn't deserve that. Can you imagine? But why didn't she deserve that if it was, she's grateful that she had the choice, but good things come from God and she didn't deserve that. Why would God, just take me for a second here, why would God be disappointed with that decision making if nothing was wrong with it? And again, I'm not even saying that that's what she's saying, I'm just asking the question, why would God not be happy with that decision? Just something to kind of think about. Again, you, you're saying you identify as a Christ-like Christ woman, why would God not be happy with that decision, right? There's, if what you're saying is 100% accurate, why would God not be happy with that decision? Can you imagine? standing on the start line, on the precipice of achieving your lifelong dream, and you know what you just did two weeks ago? Hmm. It was awful. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I don't know what my life... She's saying again, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but I'm grateful that I had the choice. She'd just say, you know, it was a terrible decision. I wish I never made it. I regret making it, and I don't think anyone else should make that decision, because if you don't make it, 
God will bless you. What is so challenging about that? Why as Christians do we keep feeling we have to take the knee to culture and to what the world is telling us? What is so profound is when Cardi B got pregnant and she was at the height of her career at the time. And again, I'm not advocating for Cardi B. I think Cardi B makes the most nasty music. You know, she's come out and said her music activates demons. Like, I am not advocating for Cardi B as someone who is a follower of Christ. But she came out and said, you know, everyone was telling me to have an abortion and I chose not to have an abortion because I thought, why can't I have both? Why can't I be successful? Why can't I be a mother? Why can't I be a wife? Why can't I be all these things? And I, I remember thinking like, wow, Cardi B gets it, but some people in the church don't get it. What, what, you know, what is that disconnect? At least on this one, this one issue, if there was ever an issue that Cardi B had, had the right mindset on, it was on this one, which, you know, the irony is, is you know, breathtaking, right? Because she's promoting all this pr promiscuity in her music. And then she's saying, you know, I'm not going to have an abortion. You know, why can't I be a mother as well? Which I agree with that point. But in the long term, why don't we have that mindset in, in Christendom? Why don't, why don't um, women who are Christ-like and men who are Christ-like advocate for life in spite of the hardships and the challenges and the issues that will come, as, come up as a, as a result? Now, we're going to skip to Dr. Yenny Abraham's story. <clears throat> I think this is the one story in the whole kind of topic where she says she had to have an abortion in order to save her life. And I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper into this and see what exactly the results are that. Because we've been hearing this conversation come up again and again, having an abortion to save the mother's life, right? We've heard two stories at least that had nothing to do with saving the life, um, at least medically from that standpoint. Um, so let's see what this, this um, testimony is all about. Exercising again, I'm eating right. I mean, I'm good. And we get pregnant again. And this time around, it wasn't really because of any uh, medical intervention. So we were like, oh, this is great. This is perfect. Okay, she's describing that she got pregnant. She couldn't get pregnant previously. Describing she got pregnant. This is perfect. I remember going for like three scans that week just to confirm and we could not find baby. And then it, eventually on one of the scans, we did see baby, but the baby was trapped in my tube. And um, and so, so the first thing she tells me, my doctor tells me is, you know, I think that we are gonna either have to have surgery or we're gonna have to figure out a way to make this a medically sound abortion. And Now, okay, this is something that's come up a lot and I think it's important that we really take a moment here. Okay, if a, a, if a fertilized egg um, or um, a zygote essentially is trapped in your fallopian tube, what that is, is something called an ectopic pregnancy. And I'm gonna put up a little screenshot here so it kind of breaks down exactly what that is. But I can assure you an ectopic pregnancy is not the same as having an abortion, right? And she's gonna go on to describe this, but essentially um, an ectopic pregnancy is a surgery or something that is, that, that is done to save the life of the mother. Because if you get pregnant in your fallopian tube, the baby grows, it could kill both of you, right? The fetus in itself is not actually going to be viable at least from what I understand, right? And I could be wrong here, but I don't think I am. But that's a totally different thing than having a healthy, normal, natural pregnancy and then going on to not uh, keep the child or have an abortion because of these other factors that have come into play. Now, she's gonna describe it here, but you know, just to, to be very clear, an ectopic pregnancy and a surgery to heal or, or to mitigate an ectopic pregnancy that might result in the fetus not surviving is not the same as having an elective abortion. There's a conversation that could happen around that, but to say that Roe v. Wade is built on the backs of ectopic pregnancies and not of elective abortions for the sake of career, dreams, and pride, I'm not buying it. And I don't think Christians should buy it either. Now, I wanna skip ahead to the part here. I don't wanna discount her, her story, um, but I wanna get to this pastor talking about why the church has been quiet about this topic. They've been awfully quiet yes, right yes, now. Yes. Chelsea, why do you think that is? Mm. I can tell you why I've been quiet. I feel very humbled. Mm. And I don't know sometimes the fine line between humbled and humiliated. Mm. Um, I'm a person who follows the teachings of Jesus. And one of those teachings says that we weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, I feel completely humbled and... Who if someone is weeping because they can't have an elective abortion, I don't know if that's someone we should necessarily be weeping with. Instead, trying to reveal the light of Christ to them and guide them to a place where if they're scared and fearful about having this baby, that they can know that they are trusted, they are supported, they are loved by a community of people who want to reflect Christ in their lives. I think this is an opportunity for those who weep for us to comfort them through community, through fellowship, through 
finances, through medical care. There are so many opportunities where we could come to those who are scared about this decision because they're scared of what the future holds and comfort them rather than say, you know what, it's so disappointing that you can't get an elective abortion anymore. I think that's something um, a little bit skewed there. ...and do not know how to follow that teaching. It just seems impossible to be able to do that in this moment. And I There's nothing impossible about rejoicing as a Christian that babies will no longer be killed. There is something to the element of comforting those who will be afraid of what they'll have to ch tackle and challenge. But in the same way that people are born into poverty every day, that people are born without limbs every day, that people are born into extenuating circumstances every single day, where you wake up and your child has just passed away, or your father has just passed away, or you have a stroke and now you're paralyzed. People encounter these situations that are extenuating every single step of the way. No eye has seen nor ear has heard what the Father has prepared for us. So why not do we take this opportunity to capitalize on that? I think there's a lot of rejoicing to be had. I think there's a lot of comforting to those who are weeping to be had. But I don't think we should um, say, you know what? This is terrible that you can't get an elective abortion. Um, you know, I'm crying right alongside you that you can't make that decision. This moment, and I am embarrassed by some of the rejoicing at the extent at the cost of somebody's pain. I think there is an element where Christianity is kind of maybe taking shots at those um, who are on the other side of the fence and get gotten nasty to an extent. I understand there's a lot of passion on both sides. We should be mindful that our celebration is um, reflective of the nature of Christ and we shouldn't be taking shots or attacking or spewing political hate towards somebody, you know, whether they're on the other side of the fence, because at the end of the day, we're not going to win them over that way. We shouldn't <laughs> waffle, though. We shouldn't be on the fence about this, though. We shouldn't compromise our beliefs for one second. We should stand firm, celebrate, voice a, a shout of praise that no more babies, or less babies from that matter, are going to be killed as a result of this being passed. But at the same time, being kind in the way that we present the scripture and we present factual information with them. Chelsea, in light of all of, all of these heartbreaking and and really gut-wrenching stories, what role can and should the church play to support those now that are not empowered to make the decision? As I think about the story of Jesus with a woman who was caught in the midst of adultery, yeah. and that's very much a woman-based story in the Bible because she was caught in the very act. So where was the man in this story? You know, very similar. Just to be clear, the man in this story about Jesus being caught in adultery, he was also, he should have also been stoned and killed according to the law of Moses. The man should also have been killed. So, so it's just worth noting here that this law that supposedly punishes only women um, really should be punishing men too. So uh, I think someone said, you know, if um, for every man that, that uh, commits a rape and results in a pregnancy, instead of the baby getting killed, the man should be killed. I mean, I think there's something kind of interesting there. And biblically, historically, if a man was to rape a woman, he would be killed. So this, this idea, yeah, he, he, he skated and he got away. He was able to navigate away from it. I think they were trying to make an example out of the woman and really trying to put Jesus in an untenable position. But he should have also been stoned in this story and, and in this context. Very similar to a woman facing an unwanted pregnancy. She just could be left alone, the yeah. same way this woman was left alone. Yeah. And in this moment, Jesus didn't say anything. It's one of the beautiful silent moments yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. And he just got down and wrote in the dirt. And then he's just said this incredible statement. He said, let him who is without sin yes, throw the first, the first stone. stone. Mm -hmm. And I think as Christians, as faith leaders, as community leaders, we need to be really in touch with our own shortcomings. We should absolutely be in touch with our own shortcomings and our own weaknesses. But let's be clear, he who has the, uh, was without sin cast the first stone, they were trying to kill this woman and have the blood be on Jesus' hand. They're trying to kill this woman. Um, but this is a real life situation that's happening during Jesus' time. He is not saying, um, uh, well, you know what? <laughs> let, let me pause for a second. After he says that, he tells her, where are your accusers? They're gone. Right. And then he says, go and sin no more. So go and don't keep making these same decisions. Jesus doesn't tell the woman after she's been caught in adultery and been spared, which we have all kind of faced. We have been caught in our sin and we have been spared by the love of Jesus. He tells us, don't go and sin no more. He doesn't say, go and advocate for more adultery, 
don't go, don't go. He doesn't say go and advocate for more sin. Go advocate for more adultery. Go advocate for more abortions. No, he says the opposite. So the, the tone and the tenure that this person is taking as a, as a Christian, I believe pastor is totally off base. Jesus is telling her, where are your accusers? Amen. What a beautiful thing. Go and sin no more. Amen. What a beautiful thing. These Christian women talking about abortion should be on the other side of the fence. If they're taking that story literally, they should say, go and sin no more. Abortion obviously is a bad decision. These women are sharing that they've regretted that decision multiple times. So going on to say you should have the choice or have the option is the exact opposite of what Jesus is saying right here. Now for this particular video, it, it goes on for a little bit longer and I think I've kind of dove into every aspect that I could. I think I want to end on this note though. I, I really want to hit this home. Christ and God and the Holy Spirit, our Father has so much love and admiration and desire to become intimately known with every single one of us. He knows us more than anyone ever will or anyone ever has. And on top of that, he has crafted every single beautiful human life in the womb from the very start. Why are we advocating that abortion is a choice or that it should be something that we just choose to do or that we can? God is a respecter of our choice. That is why we have free will. In the same light though, God is also a respecter of the consequences of those actions. And he's also a respecter of the sacrifice that Christ gave to redeem us from our sins. When the woman was caught in adultery, he said, go and sin no more. When David committed that sin with Bathsheba, a, a consequence was dealt out and David turned and repented. Every time that God has, or, or uh, the servants of God have committed a sin against God, the consequences have always existed. When King Saul did not listen to God and disobeyed, the consequences were dealt. When Hezekiah did not listen, the consequences were dealt. When David did not listen, the consequences were dealt. When King Solomon did not listen, the consequences were dealt. When Peter did not listen, saying, I will not deny you, the consequences were dealt. Every single time, consequences exist. What is the difference between those who serve God in midst of consequences and don't? repentance. Those who turn from their ways are sorrowful for what they have done and repent for their sin and turn back to Christ, always find salvation and comfort. In the same way, we should be constantly looking to those or those decisions that we have made that have caused pain, that have ended a life in the case of abortion, and decide, how can I turn and repent from this? Go and sin no more. Instead of advocating for it and kneeling again to that to that powerful idol of pride, of career, of our dreams, of self, and ultimately of the culture. I really hope this was revealing. I really would encourage you to share this with somebody. Maybe it can bless somebody in a major way and we can start this dialogue. This should be a no-brainer for Christians, but the fact that it's coming up over and over and over again has prompted me to want to share more and more thoughts on it. So please be sure to share this with somebody. Again, I'm FLF. Let's continue to light of Babylon and God bless.